Welcome to the 150th episode of Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. And I'm Tad Johnson. 11 years ago, we created Native Report to celebrate the best of Indian country, to provide an opportunity for our leaders, our elders, our youth and our community members to share important topics and stories. It has been an amazing journey filled with inspirational stories about how communities and individuals have taken on huge challenges. About our leaders continuing the fight for sovereignty and about our youth growing into young leaders. Stories of Native artists, authors, actors, and musicians finding and honing their creative voice and vision, finding a place of prominence on the national stage. Well, we aren't done yet, but just in case we ever forget that we're standing on the shoulders of giants, on this episode of Native Report, we're looking back at 10 seasons of great stories from Indian country. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. As you could probably tell already, this is a special edition of Native Report. Stacy and I don't usually get to sit down together and talk like this, but the 150th episode makes this a landmark. And it's a good time to look back at some of the places we've been and the people we've met over the last 10 seasons. And to remember some of our favorite stories, although honestly it's been almost impossible to pick just a few. It's so hard to choose because we've had the privilege of meeting so many amazing people in Indian country. We thank everyone who has appeared on Native Report for the trust you've placed in us to tell your story. One of the most memorable experiences on this show was visiting the United Nations in New York City. I got to see and talk to people from all over the world attending the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and learn about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The Permanent Forum is an advisory body with a mandate to discuss indigenous issues related to economic and social development, culture, the environment, education, health, and human rights. The idea of the Permanent Forum was actually uh, discussed by indigenous peoples while the working group on indigenous populations was doing its sessions. Uh, we had a meeting in 1992 in Chimaltenango in Guatemala and it was upon the invitation of uh, Rigoberta Menchutum and uh, several indigenous leaders from all over the world came together to decide uh, what should be the key programs of the first international decade of the world's indigenous people and we agreed that one of the things we should push for is the establishment of a permanent forum on indigenous peoples and we made a strategy that during the 1993 world human rights uh, conference, uh, this idea will be proposed. And it was proposed by the representative of the Greenland Home Rule government, and uh, it was adopted. And that's when the workshop working, uh, expert working groups on the permanent forum was established. One key document adopted by the General Assembly is the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. An important document. So often history is made uh, right before our eyes as, as we do this program. Mm -hmm. um, so often historic events, those moments when everything changes, come after years and even decades of hard work, which makes the celebration of them all the more unforgettable, like the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian. Of all the bills you worked on over the, all those years, what, what, what ones stand out the most? Well, I think the one that stands out the most because perhaps it will have the longest legacy is um, the establishment of the National Museum of the American Indian. We developed legislation to authorize the establishment of the museum. That was enacted into law in November of 1989. And in September of 2004, the museum opened. There were thousands of people, I'm sure you were amongst them, uh, of Native people from North, Central, and South America that came to the National Mall. 
and I always get choked up when I talk about this, but because thousands of people dressed in their native dress walk toward the Capitol to reclaim their proper place in history. And it was incredibly moving to have all those people feel that they were reclaiming not only their proper place in history, but a principal place at the foot of the Capitol, base of the Capitol, uh, a prominent place that, that Native people, the first Americans, rightfully deserve to occupy. Wow. Stacy, uh, Patricia Zell worked for the U.S. Senate for years and years and worked on a lot of legislation. And um, to pick that particular piece of legislation in that particular moment and to have that be that moving for her was an important moment, uh, I think, on the program. Right, agreed. The next person in this next clip is one of the many people who inspired me. Sam McCracken, a visionary at Nike World Headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon, who, with the support of Nike, developed the Nike Air Native Shoe and the N7 Fund. A normal Nike women's running shoe is a B-width, and 93% of the women we scanned were a D-width or wider. So we saw that there was something specific we needed to do, so we came up with a specific last called the uh, N7 Last, and the last is what you build the shoe on, and we use that to build the uh, Nike Air Native N7 shoe. The shoe was in development for three years, making its debut on September 25, 2007. It is available exclusively to tribal health promotion, disease prevention programs. A typical Native uh, tr tribal health fair, you're going to get your blood sugar checked, you're going to learn about heart disease, you're going to learn about all these different things. And there may be 30 or 40 people that show up. Well, this community used, used uh, the Air Nike Air Native N7 shoe um, as a platform to get people to come to their health fair, but more importantly, to get people to engage in their physical activity programs. So when Nike gave me permission to uh, give 100% of the profit back to Indian country, so it becomes a true social venture. So the product is being purchased and distributed into Indian country, and then we're taking those profits and putting it into a fund, and then allowing Native communities to apply back for those funds, and then, then distribute those, those dollars right back to uh, Native youth programs that are going to use sport for social change. And as we all know, diabetes is so chronic in Indian country, and that, that physical activity is the key component of that. And if we could tie all of those things in together, then we are innovating for a better world. The N7 Fund and the Nike N7 brand have helped many youth across Indian country, and we just celebrated seven years. One of the great things about doing the program is the opportunity to sit down and talk to people doing amazing things. I'll never forget sitting down with the legendary Billy Frank Jr., Nisqually Elder, who for 70 years was a fierce and tireless warrior for tribal sovereignty, traditional fishing rights, and protecting salmon fisheries for future generations. I grew up on the, on the river, born and raised on the Squally River, the mouth of the river. And that was our, our uh, in the First World War, our Squally Reservation, two thirds of it was bought by the military and for army purposes, for training troops. And so they moved my dad from Muckrook Village down to the mouth of the river and uh, replaced him and then they took that land into into restricted trust status like the reservation but it was clean off in the reservation it was eight miles off the reservation so now we're sitting on the mouth of the river and that's where i was born and raised and i start fishing and dad taught me how to fish and everything and so that that was kind of my life and you know and i fished all year round and from a little kid, you know, growing up and it's so important to all of us. Stacy Billy was an amazing man and he, uh, unfortunately we lost him last year, uh, but he was such a national figure when he passed away, over 6,000 people came to his funeral. Definitely shows what an amazing man he was. Not only are their life stories inspirational, but what people share during their interviews is also amazing in its truth and insight, like this moment with a hero of mine, Olympic gold medalist Billy Mills. I think a very important message to give that I try to give is that, that our women are sacred. It's our women who kept our culture, our tradition, our spirituality in place. It's our women who, is, because of the role they played, they've allowed our young children 
to grow up now and to take the culture, the tradition, the spirituality, the virtues and the values that empowered the culture, tradition, and spirituality and trans tra transpose them into a present day power through their educational pursuits, through their chosen careers. And they're becoming the warriors of the 21st century. And without our women, that would not have happened. So our young people, our young women need to know they're sacred. That was such an amazing moment and, and wonderful to hear my hero, since I was a little girl, say these amazing things. Billy Mills made history at the 1964 Olympics and is a great man. We've interviewed historic figures on Native Report, which has given us the rare opportunity to see history through their eyes. Like when Vice President Walter Mondale talked about his friend Roger Jourdain of the Red Lake Nation. As Attorney General for Minnesota, and later as a United States Senator, he was able to reform Indian policy. Along the way, he made friends with many tribal leaders, most notably the Red Lake Nation chairman, the late Roger Jourdain. Roger was my buddy. I mean, we, uh, he would get me up there for uh, Indian dances. He gave me a headdress. But we would talk serious policy, and he'd come out to Washington, um, and I would see him there, or I would see him in Minneapolis, or I'd see him up in Red Lake. Whenever he came to Washington, he always had a place in the White House with me. And I remember he brought uh, some high school kids from Red Lake. To, and they wanted to dance somewhere. So we set up a platform out of the White House lawn there, and the president came out with me and we watched them dance, and they, we, we did our best to help. And I made many friends uh, during those years. That was pretty cool. What was it like to interview him? He was very laid back, and when, when I saw that he uh, was not wearing a tie, I took mine off, and he was very nice <laughs> and an incredible memory, just a, a great man to interview. And uh, actually talked a lot about the leader of your tribe, Red Lake. That's right, that's really cool, I like that. And speaking of leaders, longtime leader Shakopee Midwakanton, Dakota chairman, the late Stanley Crooks, was a great supporter of Native Report. He advised us to always keep our approach direct and honest, and our focus on the people of Indian country. Uh, history, is pretty much one-sided, even though they try to say it's balanced. Uh, it's all about the atrocities of the, the war. Uh, now, I, I'm glad to see they speak a little bit about uh, the corruption, and uh, taking the land, and uh, the not uh, fulfilling the treaties uh, as part of the cause. Uh, but they can't get past uh, the, the massacre and uh, the atrocities uh, against uh, women and children, but they both did it. The soldiers did it, the citizen soldiers did it just as badly. And the military did it when they pursued us for two years, trying to exterminate us, actually. So if uh, that's all part of it, then that's good and well, because we need to learn from history as we go forward. If you don't uh, remember your history or know your history, you're bound to repeat the uh, mistakes of the past, so with the uh, understanding and knowledge and remembrance, then healing should come with that. Where do you go from here? Well, continue to you know improve uh, the lives not only of our community, but as we've been able to reach out and help uh, the other tribes. It's a uh, Great, great uh, feeling of accomplishment, and certainly want to continue that. We are one with the earth, and we need to maintain that uh -huh, going forward. And our children need to be taught and understand that. So we will always be Indian people. Stacy, I always remember um, Chairman Crooks as being such a strong, vigorous man and a, a great tribal leader. And you can tell he's quite ill there. And mm -hmm. what was it like? I think this was his last interview, wasn't it? It was. He rarely granted interviews, but yet I was his last one. And that moment, that morning with him was just truly a touching and amazing experience for me, knowing 
that could have been the last time. So yeah, I'm really honored and humbled to have had that experience. Keeping our focus on the everyday triumphs of Indian country has led to some amazing experiences, like watching Boys Fort Ojibwe traditional healer, medicine keeper, and elder Gene Goods guy pass along his knowledge to the next generation. What I was going to show you is we're going to go through the woods here and go down toward the water there. I'm going to go find a, a, a tag alder. And this is the one that, that I was talking about earlier that, uh, that we use for internal. That same brew that you make, you can use that for cancer. Then external, you can use it for, for poison ivy or any kind of rash. You see how it looks? Yeah, that's, that, I suppose that, that's where they get the speckled alder. And remember what I was telling you about, um, this is one of them that, uh, that arrested cancer. Take it down to about, about right there, almost ground level, and about, about two feet. See, this is pretty clear. There's no, no little limbs or anything. Couple, but... But the first thing you remember, what, are, what is the first thing that you put? Tobacco. Tobacco, Tobacco, right. Anything that we take, anything that we take, the plants, we make sure we make an offering of tobacco to who? The spirit. The spirit, the spirit of this little oh. being, all right? Stacy, one thing I love about the program is that f so frequently we get uh, people like Gene Goodsky, elders that pass their wisdom on to young people, either by directly and like in that story, but our, our moments with the elders. Your stories are important to us, so thank you for passing on that knowledge. We thank so many communities for entrusting us with their stories and their most sacred places like the Grand Portage Band of Chippewa's Little Spirit Tree. When we, we say Anishinaabe, we, that means a human being. And we're part of a human family. That means all of the humans living on this earth. We're all connected. We're all connected to creation and we're all connected to each other, so this is for everybody. We have culture, we have a way of life. Bimat uh, the good life. Uh, and so this is part of that Bimat to understand that we have to honor sacred places and sacred things. And if we continue doing that, honoring those things and honoring all creation, that we will have a good life and the people will be safe, they'll be protected, they'll understand the need to share, to take care of each other, to respect each other, understand, uh, love each other. So it's very important that, that uh, the future generation understand uh, th this place, even Grand Portage, the whole area of Grand Portage, that uh, our ancestors re preserved this area for us. It's only been through years of uh, uh, going out and seeking that knowledge of the traditions and the history and the understandings that over the years I, I began to really understand the significance of, of this tree to, to our people. Beautiful. Stacy, what I, I love about that story is it started off being about the spirit tree but ended up being John Moran's philosophy of, of an Anishinaabe life. And I thought it was a beautiful, Beautifully shot story as well. Yes, definitely beautiful. My next pick is a story that includes an amazing and inspiring group of women. It's a story about a play written by my dear friend, Mary Catherine Nagel, about violence against native women in Indian country. The play shares an important message about the Violence Against Women Act and the personal stories of brave women who experienced violence and are portraying themselves in the play in front of an audience. This play, somehow, and it's hard to explain, is, is different for me than any other play I've ever worked on. The play is sponsored by the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center, and it's a resource center that was founded basically to work on this movement and to provide resources and training to grassroots level Native women activists who are working at, you know, on their reservations to do work with domestic violence and protect women and, and to change the laws. These women play themselves and they stand up and they share their stories. And it's not often, I feel, that 
as women, we're able to stand up and tell our stories that we've survived these kinds of abuse without feeling shame, without feeling like we're being blamed, without feeling that we're being judged. Because I do think theater can be, it can be a way of creating change, it can also be a way of bringing about healing. Because we've, we've been silenced for so long. My mom is screaming, no David, no! And I see him, I see him grab the gun. And he starts beating my mother over the head with the butt of the shotgun until the only screams that could be heard. Where am I? I'm under the table. Sliver of a Full Moon is something Lisa Bruner said during her interview. And I just remember when she said it, I was like, that is the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. Because I asked her during our interview, I said, at this point, at the point that I'm interviewing her, now Val was passed, which we didn't think would happen. We thought, you know, the interviews would be happening before it passed. But I said, wow, so, I mean, okay, here we are, now it's passed. <laughs> what do you think? And she's like, well, it's a miracle. It's, it's a huge victory, but it's just a sliver of the full moon we need to protect our Native women. And I was like, whoa, that is a powerful statement. And then she explained because her daughter was raped. And because rape is not covered by the statute, this doesn't change her daughter's life. And so to her, in her words, it's a miracle, but it is a sliver of the full moon needed to protect our Native women and a full moon of, of tribal sovereignty that needs to be restored. You know, that's an important message across the board throughout Indian country. Mary Catherine Nagel is a lawyer like us, and I think it's wonderful to tell our stories through theater. And that story you got from Oklahoma. And one thing yes. we need to keep in mind is, uh, I hope our viewers keep in mind that our entire crew goes with us, camera folks and right. um, uh, producers, and uh, we have a great crew. Yeah, we'd like to thank the crew of Native Report, the folks who have traveled with us on this road for the last 10 years. Producers Mike Lagarde and Julie Kellner. Educational expert and contributor Christina Woods and contributors Wanda Sayers and Rocky makes room for them. And to our photographers, Ted Pellman, Judy Morrissey, Mick, Nick Klingman, and Lance Havisto. Together we've seen some of the most beautiful places in Indian country. I'll never forget what we learned in Alaska. Drive just a ways out of town and you can have your own glacial adventure. An hour-long cruise on Portage Lake will bring you up close and personal with the Portage Glacier. There were glaciers that went from here all the way to Kodiak. Now the tops of those mountains are called Nunataks, and that's what stuck out of the glacier 15,000 years ago. Okay, now we're coming into Portage Pass or Potage, and this is where they brought the boats over. This is where the native people, this is where the Russians, this is where the miners brought kayaks, bedarkas, and canoes from Prince William Sound over into Cook Inlet. The Portage Glacier is measurably smaller than it was just a decade ago. All of Alaska's glaciers have lost ground. It's just one example of how global climate change has touched this great land. Our native villages are really on the forefront. They are suffering tremendously from the changes that are happening, very dramatic changes. And what we are focused on primarily at present is trying to get the attention of Congress. We have a number of native villages that have to remove within the near future. I'm talking about one to five years. Their villages are literally falling into the ocean due to coastal erosion. That's horrible and an important message to share. Alaska natives are right on the forefront of climate change. And that's an important story that Native Report brought to our viewers. And we want to thank our underwriters and supporters uh, through these last 10 years who have made it financially pro possible for us to do this work. The Shakopee, Mdewakanton and Sioux community, the Blandon Foundation, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, and the Grotto Foundation. And we want to thank all of you who travel with us every week. Thanks for watching and commenting and offering your story ideas and suggestions. Remember, you can always catch up with us online at nativereport.org or on our Facebook page and Twitter. So here's to the next 10 years of Native Report. I'm Tad Johnson. And I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you again. Watch Native Report every week on your public television station. Good.
Are you going? Yeah, I'm rolling. Oh, <laughs> I'm just practicing. Come on. <laughs> Trying to get my hair not so plastered off my face. It's okay. Okay. From influential native leaders to inspirational home times, home time. <laughs> All right. Okay, focus again. My nose is running. <laughs> it's all right. Hi, I'm Tad Johnson. Behind me is Cyrus Dollin's iconic sculpture, Appeal to the Great Spirit. This season on Native Report will be in Massachusetts and several other places. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tad Johnson. I'm scared as hell. I'm about to get hit by a car. <laughs> Hi. Stacy Thunder is Ojibwe from the Red Lake and Lakota Ray Nations and is the legislative counsel for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Professor Tad Johnson is the director of the Master of Tribal Administration and Governance program at the University of Minnesota Duluth and is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Closed captioning is provided by the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. <laughs>